Namaste and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today, we would be analyzing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper of 16th of August 2018. Now, let us begin. Now, we have taken this article from page 11. Now, what this article talks about is Operation Gaganyan. And from this article, what we'll do is try to understand about its two aspects. So, the first aspect that we'll try to understand is GSLV MK3. And the second aspect that we'll try to understand is about the crew module atmospheric re-entry experiment or care. So now let us first understand about GSLV MK3. Now GSLV MK3 is a three-stage heavy lift launch vehicle. Wherein GSLV MK3 has a three-stage fuel cycle wherein it consists of a solid strap-on wherein if you take a look at the image it is the solid rocket boosters S200 wherein JSLV MK3 uses two S200 solid rocket boosters, which provide the huge amount of thrust that is required for liftoff. Secondly, it also consists of a core liquid booster, and the core stage consists of the L110 liquid stage, and this liquid stage is powered by two Vikas engines. And apart from this, the three-stage fuel cycle also consists of a cryogenic upper stage, and this cryogenic upper stage called C25, and this C25 is powered by CE20, which is India's largest cryogenic engine. Now, this JSLV MK3 is designed to carry roughly around 4 ton of satellites into geosynchronous transfer orbit, or roughly about 10 tons to lower Earth orbit, wherein lower Earth orbit is roughly around 600 km altitude, wherein JSLV MK3 is able to carry about 10 tons to lower Earth orbit due to its powerful cryogenic stage engine. And this powerful cryogenic engine enables GSLV MK3 to place heavy loads into lower Earth orbit at roughly around 600 km altitude. So now hopefully you've understood the basic features of the GSLV MK3. And it has been declared as the launch vehicle for taking the manned crew module into space. Now apart from this, what you should also know that there was an experimental flight in December of 2014 of GSLV MK3 and this experimental flight was designated as GSLV MK310 and it is now known as the launch vehicle Mark 3 or the care mission. And this experimental flight carried the crew module atmospheric re-entry experiment or care as its payload. And what you should remember is the objectives of the crew module atmospheric re-entry experiment wherein its first objective was a demonstration of the re-entry flight of crew module wherein currently, when we launch satellites, they are not required to come back to Earth. However, when we launch a human space flight program, we require the humans which have been launched into space to also come back. And therefore, this experimental flight demonstrates the re-entry capability of the crew module. And apart from this, the second objective of CARE was for end-to-end -end parachute system validation, which further reinforces the safe re-entry of the crew module. So now hopefully up till here you understood the basic facts about JSLV MK3 and the crew module atmospheric re-entry experiment or care. Now what you should remember with regards to your prelims examination is that JSLV MK3 uses a three-stage fuel cycle wherein it uses a cryogenic upper stage fuel cycle and a core stage liquid fuel cycle and a solid fuel rocket boosters. And apart from this what you should also remember is that JSLV MK3 is designed to carry loads of satellite into geosynchronous transfer orbit and also to low earth orbits. And what you should also remember is that JSLV MK3 in an experimental flight in December 2014 carried the crew module atmospheric re-entry experiment or CARE as its payload. And this CARE mission would demonstrate the re-entry flight of a crew module. Wherein previously questions have been asked in your prelims examination such as on the Mangalyaan in the prelims of 2016, on AstroSat again in the prelims of 2016 and the difference between PSLV and JSLV in the prelims of 2018. And it is within this context that JSLV MK3 and the CARE mission becomes relevant when studying for Operation Gaganyan or India's human space flight program. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from the editorial page on page 9. Now what has happened is is that the United States has recently sanctioned Turkish ministers and the United States sanctioned Turkish ministers because Turkey had recently detained an American citizens on terrorism charges. And apart from this, the United States and Turkey have also engaged in retaliatory tariffs. And because of the US sanctions and US tariffs, 
it augmented the faults in the turkish economy which caused the turkish currency lira to lose about 40% of its value against the us dollar so now hopefully you have understood the current event that this article talks about wherein the us has sanctioned turkish ministers because turkey detained an american citizen on terrorism charges and apart from this the us and turkey continue to engage in a tariff war and this us sanctions and tariffs augmented the faults that already exist in the turkish economy and thereby caused the turkish lira to lose about 40% of its value to the us dollar now let us understand the international importance of this current event now the fall of the turkish lira caused a decrease in investor sentiment in the currencies of the emerging economies and because this fall of the turkish lira caused a fall in the investor sentiment in currencies of emerging economies especially in asia it caused the indian rupee to also fall in comparison to the us dollar now you have to understand as to one of the major reason as to why the fall in the indian rupee because of the fall in turkish lira was highlighted in the news because the indian rupee breached the 70 rupees mark against the us dollar for the first time however the international importance of the fall in the turkish lira would be of a temporary nature and therefore what is required to be seen in the future is on how the indian rupee moves forward as against the us dollar and so therefore this news is currently in transition and we'll have to wait and see on how the rupee moves forward as against the us dollar and so now with this let us move on to the next article now we have taken this article from the editorial page on page 8 now what this article talks about is the national health protection mission so what we'll do with regards to this article is first understand the features of the national health protection mission and then understand as to what this editorial talks about Now the National Health Protection Mission which is also known as the Pradhan Mantri Jan Aarogya Abhiyan is a part of the Ayushman Bharat scheme and it is the flagship scheme of the government of India to ensure universal health care to the weaker sections of the society Now the National Health Protection Scheme is a centrally sponsored scheme which falls under the Ayushman Bharat Mission and what you should remember is that it is under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare wherein the center and the state will share the cost of the national health protection mission within the cost ratio of 60s to 40 wherein 60% of the cost would be taken up by the center government and 40% by the state and this national health protection mission will replace the rashtriya swasth bima yojana and the senior citizen health insurance scheme and the pradhan mantri jan aarogya abhiyan will provide 10 crore families with health coverage of roughly rupees 5 lakhs per family on an annual basis Now you have to understand that the National Health Protection Mission is an entitlement based scheme wherein if a person has been identified within the socio economic caste census he will be a beneficiary to the entitlements under the National Health Protection Mission and this National Health Protection Mission will work on the principle of cooperative federalism wherein at the national level an Ayushman Bharat National Health Protection Mission agency would be set up and the states and the union territories would implement the scheme by a dedicated entity called the state health agency and the beneficiaries who are entitled under the scheme can avail both public and private facilities although there are conditions applied on private facilities to which a beneficiary of the scheme may go to and the scheme will have a major impact on the reduction of out of pocket expenditure wherein it would increase the benefits to roughly the poorest and the vulnerable section of the population and would cover almost all the secondary and many tertiary hospitalizations wherein it would have a coverage of rupees 5 lakh for each family which would be on an annual basis and there would be no restriction on the family size meaning every member of the family which is part of the scheme would get the benefits of this scheme now what is required for you to remember with regards to your prelims examination is first the aim of this scheme wherein it intends to ensure universal health care to the weaker sections of the society the second part that you need to remember is that it is under the ministry of health and family welfare and apart from this what you should also remember are the specific special features of the scheme where in the first aspect that you need to remember is the cost ratio its coverage money the basis of identification for the people under the scheme and lastly its implementing policy so now hopefully you have understood the basic features of the pradhan mantri jan aarogya abhiyan or the national health protection mission so now let us understand as to the focus of the editorial now the editorial provides various measures to make the national health protection mission 
more effective. Now going to the editorial, the central government may provide an outline for the National Health Protection Mission, but the actual implementation of the National Health Protection Mission would be from the state governments. And therefore, according to the author, since the execution of the scheme is through state agencies, a consensus should be reached for the smooth functioning of the National Health Protection Mission. And so therefore, according to the author, the involvement of the private sector in the National Health Protection Mission should be done in a transparent and a smooth manner. Apart from this, according to the author, there should be a planned increase in the public health expenditure towards 2.5% of India's GDP and 8% of the state budget. Since there is a lack of distribution of hospitals in India and there is a lack of capacity of human resource such as doctors and nurses which are going to cause potential hurdles in the implementation of the scheme. And therefore to address all of these hurdles, according to the author, the public health expenditure in India should be increased. The third point raised by the author is that private insurance is only a short term solution and the government of India should focus on investment in the public health sector. And apart from this, according to the author, an ombudsman or a low pass should be created to deal with the complaints of the users of the National Health Protection Mission. Apart from this, according to the author, the scheme should be extended to all children and senior citizens. And apart from this, the scheme should also cover outpatient consultations and essential drugs. Wherein, according to the author, by extending the scheme to all children and senior citizens and also including outpatient consultations and essential drugs, it would reduce the cost of out-of-pocket spending for many citizens of India, especially the poor and the vulnerable section. So now hopefully you have understood as to what this article talks about. Now let us understand as to where it would be placed in your UPSC syllabus. Wherein the National Health Protection Mission would be placed in GS Paper 2 within the section Social Justice and within the subsection Issues Relating to Development and Management of Health. And apart from this, it would also be placed in Welfare Schemes for Vulnerable Sections. Wherein previously a question has been asked in GS Paper 2 of 2015 which had asked that the public health system has limitation in providing universal health coverage. Do you think that the private sector could help in bridging the gap? What other viable alternatives would you suggest? Wherein a question for your practice is highlight the salient features of the National Health Protection Mission, analyze the hurdles in its implementation and suggest measures to improve upon it. And you can answer this question with the help of the editorial and the explanation given in this section. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from page 4. Now what this article talks about is that the Maharashtra government has announced emergency measures to tackle the widespread pink ballworm infestations that has taken hold in the Maharashtra state. Now what you should remember about the pink ballworm are certain facts for your prelims examination. The first fact that you should remember is that pink ballworm is an insect which is known for being a pest in cotton farming. Apart from this, what you should also remember is that the pink ballworm is native to Asia. But the pink ballworm has become an invasive species in most of the world's cotton growing regions. And in parts of India, the pink ballworm is now resistant to the first generation transgenic Bt cotton. And therefore you should also remember that the pink ballworm is now resistant to the Bt cotton. Wherein the company Monsanto has admitted that the Bt cotton is ineffective against the pink ballworm infestation. So the pink ballworm infestation on cotton is now generally being controlled with insecticides. However, the control of the pink ballworm with insecticides is currently not successful. And therefore, we'll have to wait and see on how the Maharashtra government moves forward in combating the pink ballworm. However, with regards to your prelims examination, what you should remember is that the pink ballworm is an insect which is known for being a pest in cotton farming. And this pink ballworm is native to Asia but has now become resistant to the first generation BG cotton. Wherein a question was asked in the prelims of 2018 as to why a particular plant called Proposis juliflora was mentioned in the news. And in similar terms, a question for your practice is pink ballworm was recently in the news in the context of, and you would know from this article and the explanation given in this section, that the pink ballworm was recently in the news in the context of being an invasive pest in cotton farming. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from the editorial page on page 8. Now what this article talks about is that SEBI constituted a committee on fair market conduct. And this committee was formed under the chairmanship of TK Vishwanathan. And this editorial mentions about suggestions that were given by this Vishwanathan committee on extending powers of SEBI. 
Now, this committee was intended to review the existing legal framework to deal with market abuse so as to ensure a fair market conduct in the securities market. And therefore, the TK Vishwanathan committee was intended to review the surveillance investigation and enforcement mechanism that were being undertaken by SEBI and thereby protect the interest of investors from market abuse, thereby ensuring a fair market conduct in the securities market. And this committee had made various recommendations. Wherein the first main recommendation was that it recommended amendments in several acts related to SEBI, such as the SEBI Act of 1992. And apart from this, the committee also recommended to empower SEBI to act against those who aid and abet in financial frauds, meaning that SEBI can act against those who indulge in illegal practices in the markets, such as accountants and auditors. And therefore, according to the committee, the SEBI should be empowered to act against them. And apart from this, the committee also recommended to empower SEBI to grant immunity to whistleblowers who help uncover illegal financial activities in the securities market. Apart from this, the committee also gave new ideas to address market manipulation and the creation of processes to make investigation into financial fraud cases faster. And apart from this, the committee also recommended that SEBI should be given the power to tap phones so as to uncover financial frauds. Now, the editorial has highlighted various benefits of the recommendation of the TK Vishwanathan committee, wherein the greater executive power to SEBI will help in taking swift actions against offenders. And apart from this, according to the author in the editorial, it will also free SEBI from political influence. And wherein SEBI will also be better placed as compared to the government of India to implement various laws against financial frauds. And by empowering SEBI with further powers, it will have a strong deterrent effect meaning that it would stop people in indulging in financial frauds. So now hopefully you have understood the various features of the TK Vishwanathan committee on fair market conduct. And moreover, you also understand the recommendations of this committee with regards to SEBI. Now with regards to UPSC slavers, now SEBI and the recommendations of the TK Vishwanathan committee would be placed in GS Paper 2 within the subsection Statutory and Regulatory Bodies, wherein SEBI is both a statutory and a regulatory body. And so now with this, let us move on to the next article. Now we have taken this article from the editorial page on page 9. Now what this article talks about is Section 17A of the Prevention of Corruption Amendment Bill of 2018. Now this Section 17A of the Prevention of Corruption Amendment Bill of 2018 bars any inquiry or investigation by an anti-corruption agency such as the CBI against a public servant. However, it bars the inquiry or investigation against a public servant in the discharge of his official functions or duties. And what the author has highlighted as being a concern in Section 17A is that it requires prior approval of the central or the state government, wherein this provision of Section 17A would apply to all public servants, wherein the author has raised the concern that Section 17A places anti-corruption agencies such as the CBI at the mercy of the government. And so, regards to Section 17A, the author gives the example of Section 6A of the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act, wherein a special provision was inserted in the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act in 2003, wherein under this provision, the CBI was not able to conduct an inquiry or investigation against an officer of the central government who was at the level of Joint Secretary or above, wherein the CBI required the prior approval of the central government to conduct an inquiry or investigation against an officer of the central government who is at the level of the joint secretary or above. However, this provision, which was inserted in the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act of 1946, was declared null and void by the Supreme Court in 2014. And according to the author, Section 17A of the Prevention of the Corruption Amendment Bill of 2018 might also be declared as null and void by the Supreme Court if Section 17A becomes the law. Now, you have to understand that the focus of this article is speculative in nature wherein the Prevention of the Corruption Amendment Bill of 2018 is yet to become an act and therefore Section 17A is yet to become a law and therefore we'll have to wait and see on how the Prevention of the Corruption Amendment Bill of 2018 moves forward and more specifically with regards to Section 17A. But hopefully you've gotten a basic understanding of the concerns raised by the author with regards to Section 17A of the Prevention of Corruption Amendment Bill of 2018. And now with this we come to an end in the analysis of today's newspaper. Now we move on to the question for today. 